Hello, and uh, welcome to the National Gallery. I'm Matthias Wivel, the Art Jepsen curator of 16th century Italian paintings. Here at the gallery and the co-curator with Tom Henry and David Exergen of the Raphael exhibition, which I will be speaking about today. It's, it's a great pleasure to talk about this exhibition. It's been six years in the making, obviously postponed by COVID, uh, but still, uh, work was not over. It was meant to, be, meant to have happened in, in 2020 to coincide with the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death. Uh, now we're celebrating the 502nd anniversary. <laughs> and I think actually in some ways the exhibition is better for it. Uh, we had more time to, to think about it and, and, and plan it. So I hope that you uh, have had an opportunity to visit it or that you will have an opportunity. It, it really is uh, a treat. Uh, I'm biased, but I, I do think so. It's of course installed, as you probably know, upstairs, not in the Sainsbury wing. Because of the nature of the show, it would just not fit down there. So it's staged in the 16th century galleries with a, with a congenial design that I think uh, approximate some of Raphael's design ideas, his, his, his um, preference for the circular form uh, for, with the, these arches that have been inserted and so on. Um, unfortunately, no natural light because we have tapestries and drawings. Uh, normally, of course, the great, great glory of these galleries is that they emit natural light, but sadly. But still, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's an exhibition that, uh, that aims to cover, and this is actually a surprise to me. Um, it was, it's the first exhibition, along with the one that was being planned uh, concurrently with ours for the Scuderia in Rome, that actually did happen in 2020, but mostly was closed. Uh, these two exhibitions uh, are the first ever to attempt to cover the entirety of Raphael's career and the entirety of his output. So not just to see him as a painter and, and draftsman, but also as an architect and as a designer more broadly of uh, works in, in a variety of media, from tapestry, as I said, to prints, to applied arts. Uh, also his work as an archeologist, as pioneering archeologist, as an art theorist. So all these things come together to describe this, this Renaissance man and I hope that the exhibition helps help, help people see him, get, a, get a more synthetic view of him. Also as an entrepreneur, as a social climber, as a, as a man of, of, of his time in many ways. But let's go back uh, to the beginning. Raphael was born in Urbino in 1483 uh, and he was essentially an artisan's son. His, his, um, his father, Giovanni Santi, was a painter and had a painter's workshop. He was painter to the court in Urbino, and this was a very aspirational court in terms of its humanist aspirations. Humanism is the, uh, the pursuit of knowledge outside the domain of theology, so uh, poetry, but also science. I mean, it, 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 it covers a wide variety of, of, um, of interest and, 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 and pursuit. It, but, and this was, this was really a, a court that was very sort of ahead of its time uh, for this. And, and so Raphael grew up and by osmosis took in a lot of this knowledge. So in a way he's a well-educated artist for somebody who's an artisan. Uh, he, 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 from very early on he was exposed to the latest uh, thinking in terms of, of, of natural science and also um, poetry and art. So, so that, that's, a, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Very smart, he absorbed everything like a sponge uh, and, and really uh, had a synthetic mind that could, that could incorporate what he learned in his work. And clearly he was, he was talented from, from the outset. I mean, it was, it was clear that this was some, some sort of prodigy. Importantly, before I move on, I should note that uh, he, was made, he was an orphan at ele age 11. His, his mother died, uh, Maria di Battista Ciala, she died uh, when he was only eight, and his father died when he was 11. So that surely is also a formative experience in his life, as it would be for anybody. Uh, we have this, this drawing of him around that age. Well, suppose a drawing of him. I actually doubt that it's him. I mean, this is, this is we describe it in, as a, tentatively as a self-portrait made when he was very young. Uh, we have it as like age 15, 16. I think this is a younger boy, and I'm not quite sure that it's actually a self-portrait. But importantly, it opens the exhibition, and it, I think it, it 
reveals the, his level of engagement with people, whether this is himself or, as I think, some other boy. There is an intimacy here, a description of somebody, uh, an engagement that, that I think is very key to understanding Raphael, his human engagement. It, it is contrasted in the exhibition with the drawing on the right here, uh, which is, I think, you know, around the same time, slightly later, maybe. Um, and this is a different kind of drawing. This is a drawing meant for painting, the one on the right. It is uh, it's a, it's a chalk drawing, the other is metal point. Uh, so the media are different, but it's also different purpose. This is, here he's studying a figure that is going to be, be transferred into a painting. And so this is no longer a person, but a, but a figure in a, in a uh, as it happens, an Assumption of the Virgin. And you see it's a very different kind of drawing from what we have here. This is very close, intimate kind of study here. Uh, and then this, which, um, which is, is more about the energy of the figure. Uh, and, and you see his strokes. And this is also important, uh, his, his strokes of the chalk, his curving motion of his hand. Very key to, to understanding Raphael. It's, it's, he seeks harmony through this curving stroke. And you see that already in, in, in his early uh, drawings here, also the, the, the tendency to construct form from, from, the, from circular movement. You see the this, this circular part of his face there, like the, the, the outline of his profile, his lost profile here. Uh, it, it's placed next to this, this uh, beautiful painting, also from very early in his career, uh, of St. Sebastian uh, set against a beautiful atmospheric landscape, one of the most beautiful he painted, I think. And you see his sense of design here, how the arrow is just cropped at the left, how the, 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 the halo is cropped at the top, how he, he occupies exactly the, the, the part of the space that he should. Uh, beautiful rendition of, of his clothes, uh, a nice de detail of, of the, the curve of his chain here, and then this part of his, this, um, this part of his undershirt, a uh, very, very elaborate one, which almost looks like musical notation. It isn't, but it makes you think of music, and I think Raphael does make you think of music in general. He sees, seeks something that analogous to musical harmony in his paintings. Uh, here, this is a very youthful drawing in his teens, and this is, this is when I talk about him being a prodigy, uh, he already in his teens. He must have taken over the family workshop at some point after his father's death, uh, and, and he'd learned his, the craft of painting from his father. But uh, he must have taken over, and, and by age 17 or something, he's, he's, uh, he's filling commissions in the region of, of the Marca and, uh, and Umbria for major altarpieces as an independent master, uh, which is a little early, you know, on the early side. And, and this, is, this is for an, art, an, an altarpiece that only survives in fragments, uh, five meters tall, like one of the biggest he ever painted. Um, and it's, it's interesting for the way that, you know, this, 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 he develops the composition, how different parts are more finished than others, and how th th this, this figure up here, which is the God the Father in the, in the final altarpiece, is basically a young man uh, that was posing for him in contemporary clothing. He was drawing it from somebody posing in the studio. We have a study of his, uh, of his face on the back. Unfortunately, we couldn't show that in the exhibition um, for reasons of conservation, but this very beautiful uh, study that I think he just did uh, out of interest. Again, we talk about his interest in, in other people. This, is, uh, this belongs to the gallery, and one of the reasons we could, we could put this uh, exhibition on at the gallery is because uh, the gallery holds one of the, the largest collections of Raphael uh, outside Italy. It's, we have 10 paintings by him, almost all uh, from his, the first decade of his career, something like that. And, and this is one of them, uh, a couple of years after the one that the, the drawing was for, and uh, a crucifixion, obviously. And, and what, what I want, would point to here this is meant for uh, a, a, a family chapel in a church in, in Città di Castello, the, the, the town you see here, it's the upper Tiber Valley, um, and it's, it's a dark space. So this is meant to project this painting, and Raphael is very good at that. I mean, he, in, on the one hand, he's, he's placing these figures down here in three-dimensional space, getting a sense of recession, which is something that artists are very occupied with at this time, the, the, the believable, uh, representation of space and, and, and figures in space. A very important concern of artists, and Raphael is learning that at this point. Uh, similarly, Christ is, is very beautifully rendered, like naturalistically, if, if idealized, naturalistically rendered. But the cross is very flat, in a way. It's sort of a graphic element that bisects the painting. And the angels here are almost heraldic in their, in their attitudes, and these, these sashes that billow from, from their, their belts are almost calligraphic. 
So he's doing what any artist, any painter who's, who's trying to represent reality, uh, negotiating the illusion of three-dimensionality with the, the reality of two dimensions that you're in a painting, like the graphic, the, the graphic element of them. And he, this is to make the point that he is, he's a great designer. He's somebody who knows the purpose of what he's doing and, 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 and successfully applies his skills to, to make it happen. Usually we have this painting on view uh, in the central axis of the gallery, so you can see it from all the way down from Whistle Jacket in the British galleries. Um, it projects that far. It really is a, a, an achievement in that sense of design. Um, increasingly, Raphael gravitates towards uh, Florence because he has sort of learned what he could in, 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 uh, in Perugia, where he's mostly based, uh, where he's been learning from um, Pietro Perugino, who's one of the great painters of the previous generation. Uh, and and the, the, the crucifixion is very much uh, come, comes out of what he learns from Perugino. But he's, he's sort of transcending that at this point. And, and he has to go to Florence where there's, there's a rich, uh, sophisticated clientele that could that, um, uh, commission paintings from him. But also, uh, they're, they're, they're great artists. It's one of the centers of art. It's a financial center. It's an intellectual center. It's a center of the arts. And so that, he has to go there to learn. Uh, so while still being based in Perugia, he goes to Florence more and more, and he works in both places. And you see this, this altarpiece also belongs to the gallery. The development, it's only a year or two later than the one we just saw. And you can see the development in terms of three-dimensionality, three, three the volume of the figures, how much has happened, uh, how much he's developing. And this is, this, uh, this is something we see with Raphael throughout, like the, the rapidity and the like how dynamic his, his development is. Um, this is just to show that uh, this is the, the Perdella. The, the, all the pieces often had these small paintings underneath, and this is one of them. Uh, also belongs to the gallery where you see John the Baptist here uh, preaching and pointing upwards to himself up here in the larger. Um, another point I want to make about this uh, altar piece is, is, the, is the architectural background and the geometry of it. He's very attentive to geometry. He's learned about perspective and so on. Again, at the court of the Rubino, he has, I guess, theoretical knowledge already and is, has also been trained somehow uh, in, in architectural knowledge. He, he knows about architecture very early on, and it's really part of his vocabulary. Architecture, uh, even though he doesn't, he doesn't design buildings yet, he's not doing that yet, he's thinking about architecture, and he rep represents it in his paintings. Um, and this is, so basically we have a square with a, with a circle um, bisecting it, and at the center of the circle we have the Virgin's face. And you can, you can start, uh, dividing it into thirds as well. I mean, it's a very uh, carefully planned geometrical um, uh, painting. And this is, this is, again, a principle that you see throughout his art. Uh, here, uh, we get to something also very important. Uh, two things are very important. Uh, first, this, is, I mean, this, is, this shows St. Catherine, the, the fourth century martyr who was tortured on a wheel, uh, uh, which was then destroyed by God with a lightning bolt because of her um, conversion to Christianity. And, uh, and then she was beheaded. Uh, Raphael, uh, this is for private patron. We don't know who. This is for private prayer or something, private devotion. Um, Raphael sort of eschews all the pain and suffering uh, of, of martyrdom to do something, to, to present something to us that is pleasant to contemplate. And this is another, this is an important thing about him too. Uh, he, he wants to put us in a, in a pleasant space, in a, in a safe space in a way, uh, to, to, um, to contemplate things that are important about life that we might not otherwise be able to appreciate. And here he, uh, he reduces the, the wheel to like, usually it's, it's depicted with spikes, here it's just these studs. Um, and we, we get a sense of, of her, of the breath coursing through her body, her lips parting as she contemplates this divine eruption out up here, uh, which is actually laid on in, in gold. Uh, so it's a, it's a moment of divine ecstasy and we can feel the breath in her body. And the serpentine uh, description of the body it has this upwards propulsive mo motion. Uh, what we also see are circular forms, as I said, circular forms, curving forms, uh, circular forms, and uh, also the headbands, the, the, the curls of her hair, the halo, everything is circular or curving. And this is Raphael's way of representing the harmony of the world. Again, I was talking about musical harmony, the divine harmony of the universe. Another important uh, thing to, uh, to, to, to be gained from looking at this painting is, is to, to sh I, I, I talked about how he came to Florence to learn from great artists, and, and indeed he did. So in this painting, he's looking for the, uh, the posture of her, 
um, he's looking at Leonardo. Leonardo is in Florence. Um, he's working there at, at this time, and Raphael very quickly uh, befriends him and insinuates himself into the studio. He was clearly very charismatic. Leonardo liked him. Uh, I think they start up a friendship. And here we have Raphael uh, copying a drawing, by Le lost drawing by Leonardo for his similarly lost painting of Leda and the Swan, uh, or is it Leda and the Goose? I mean, it doesn't look a bit like a goose here, but, uh, um, but this is Raphael copying a Leonardo drawing. He's using the basic posture, this uh, serpentine posture of Leda for uh, his St. Catherine, but as you see, the protruding knee is, is not quite there, and, the, and the, 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 the position of the hands that he's, he's adapting from Michelangelo, who's carving, uh, he's, he's supposed to carve uh, the apostles for the cathedral in Florence. He, he never does it, but, uh, but he does uh, partly complete the St. Matthew, and, and that's, that's what he's, he's, uh, he's drawing upon here. So Raphael is really synthesizing um, the influences of the two greatest artists in, in Italy at the time. You know, that he, that's who he's comparing himself with. Leonardo Michelangelo, I mean, he's, he, wanna learn, he wants to learn from the best. And he really sort of is, is seems unintimidated by them. He, he, he takes whatever he can from both of them and creates something that is entirely his own. He also, as anybody in Florence at this time, looks at Leonardo in terms of portraiture because the Mona Lisa was, uh, he, Leonardo had started painting that uh, a couple of years before um, and it was something that all Florentine artists looked at and Raphael studies it very closely you know, in drawings like this one. And I should say what I, I'm showing you here is almost entirely uh, works that are in the exhibition. I'm trying to explain the entirety of Raphael's career with just what's in the exhibition, which is basically the aim of the exhibition, so I hope it, it, it works. Um, uh, so, so this drawing, uh, ba very closely uh, adapted from, from, um, from the Mona Lisa, and that's the model he pursues in his portraiture at this time. Uh, we have another drawing similar here uh, a little earlier, and then this painting, which actually may not be by Raphael, but never mind. <laughs> I think it, it, it's, uh, seeing it in the exhibition with the other, with the other paintings, I'm actually in doubt. It's a very, very fine painting. Um, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, even if it's not, it, it doesn't undermine the point that Raphael looks to Leonardo and this is, the, this is the, um, the model that he adapts. And what he adapts from Leonardo is quite fundamental. I mean, he, Leonardo's probably the most fundamental influence on him. Um, it is, Leonardo's insight is that when he does portraits or stories, anything, uh, he, you can't just show the, the, the external reality of, of the figure or, or the sitter, uh, the, the physical presence. You have to uh, suggest the inner life because we all have an inner life. We have a psychology. I mean, that's an anachronism. It's not a word he uses, but he's, he says the motions of the spirit. So the, the, the inner life, the, the, the emotional life, the whatever, like everything that happens uh, that is not visible, you have to suggest that visibly, visually, uh, because otherwise you're not representing reality. And, and for, uh, for Leonardo, this is a scientific uh, imperative. He is there to, to, stu to study the human species. Um, and so he, he doesn't want to be uh, carried away with sort of psychologizing or empathizing or anything like that. It's about, it's about representing reality. Raphael takes that insight and he invests it, invests it with empathy. And as I said, like he, his interest in, in other people is, is very profound. And so, um, so he invests that insight from, from Leonardo with, with, with empathy and his, creates very empathetic paintings. And you see that supremely in his uh, images of the Virgin and Child. Uh, these are from his last years in, in, in Florence. And, and there, there, there are several in the exhibition. I think we've created a great room of, of, of uh, Madonnas. And it is indeed this, the subject he's most well known for, uh, the Virgin and Child. He, would, he varied it endlessly throughout his career, uh, came up with new constellations, new ways of, uh, of, the, of depicting the interaction between mother and child. And it's hard not to think about the fact that he'd lost his mother when he was eight. I mean, we don't know anything about that. You can't, we don't know what hap was happening in his motions of the spirit. Uh, but, but it seems like that formative experience would inform or would have stimulated in him uh, an idealization of family and the relation between mother and child. And I think these are some of the most endearing ones he did. Um, uh, incidentally, this is based on a Leonardo painting from many years before, which you must have seen in Leonardo's studio, now in the Hermitage. And this is based on, uh, and this is, this is based on Donatello's re release by, uh, sculptural relief by Donatello, which was seen across uh, Florence, of course, a, a, an artist several generations before Raphael. But it reveals that he's always looking at other artists and, and, and adapting their ideas. But uh, 
I will, maybe this is one of the one of the great I think loans to the exhibition. I'm, I'm really happy to have it here. Um, it, it's what's so great. I think this is most tender and most intimate uh, and 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 most emotionally charged. I think of his Madonnas, and it it, it sets up a contrast between the. Uh, the mother utterly absorbed in the moment with her child that she's pressing her, her cheek against his. And then the child, who is not absorbed in the moment but is focused on the future, uh, he is looking out, maybe sensing our presence, but he's looking out towards something else. He's thinking about something else. He's not thinking about the moment. And this is a common motif in the depiction of the Virgin of the Child. Often it's the mother who's looking out and the child who's playing, a bit like here. Um, and what he's thinking about, of course, uh, is the fact that he will eventually die on the cross. He's aware of that already as a child. Um, he's preternaturally aware uh, of his sacrifice, his coming sacrifice. And, and, and I think that's the, one of the reasons why ver like, the picture of the Virgin and Child can be so appealing and so, so popular, and indeed the bread and butter of workshops like Raphael, uh, was this fact that like, most people can relate to having a child and holding a, a, a child and, and how you know, how, how emotionally uh, important that is in your life. But also this awareness that, that when you bring a child into the world, that child will grow up and face the difficulties of life and eventually die. And this is, I think, Raphael captures that so beautifully. I mean, he really, he's really attuned to that, uh, that basic feeling that m most people recognize. Uh, this is just uh, to show how, how he adapts uh, also Michelangelo, also because this is a work you can see in London, uh, the Royal Academy, the Today Tondo, uh, where he, which, which Raphael studied in, in Florence at, at the home of the, the, the patron of that, uh, who was a friend of Michelangelo's and Raphael's. Uh, his relationship with Michelangelo is a little bit more fraught. It's not as close as that with Leonardo, but he really steals from him. And uh, here you see, you, you see how it, like, it becomes this. Um, and this would later become a problem uh, in, in their relationship. Uh, that tondo, the, the sculpture, is round, and round is the round format is, is a very um, favorite format in Florence. Uh, and Raphael works on adapting that. And you can see in the exhibition we have an earlier tondo painting by him, and then we have this, which is painted in Rome, but surely for a Florentine client because it's round. Uh, and here, how he's adapting the uh, the figures, he's he's managing to to situate the figures within this round, this circular uh, shape. Uh, which is very difficult to do uh, because the body is, is vertically oriented. So, so here actually he places the Virgin in a, in, a, in a position that is supremely uncomfortable if you think about it. Like her, her, her legs are bending in opposite directions. But Raphael makes it seem natural. Um, he makes it seem like she's relaxing. Uh, you don't get the sense of tension here, but actually. And this is one of his great skills, is making the contrived seem natural. And this is something that his contemporaries uh, really single out in, in praise of him. Then uh, he gets called to Rome. Uh, he's such a talent that he, he and probably Pope Julius II probably already knew about him from, from uh, Urbino because he had, he had relations with Urbino. Uh, and and he, at, at, by 1508, he, he invites Raphael to come to Rome to work for him. Uh, Julius II was very ambitious in terms of the church's secular power. Uh, he was in its political power. He was involved in a lot of warfare, um, but he was also and, and, and sort of establishing the power of the, of the papacy. But he was also uh, hoping to, to regenerate Rome, to create, to make Rome great again, as it were, um, by uh, a, a very a huge program of urban planning, of urban renewal. Uh, to which he, of course, employed the best architects in Italy, um, and also artists uh, of, of, of other stripes. Uh, he had invited Michelangelo there a few years previous, and then Raphael comes there in 1508. This portrait is painted a few years later, in 1511, um, and it's, it's extraordinary in, in, in many ways. It's, it's a very influential portrait. It became the paradigm for papal portraiture uh, of later generations. You think about Titian, you think about Velazquez, and you think about Francis Bacon, for example. Uh, at this point, when Raphael paints this, I mean, th what's so unusual about it is that we see this pope who is known for his irascible, imperious behavior. Uh, his, like, he's a difficult character um, who would f fly into fits of rage and so on. And when Michelangelo was to, to uh, create a, sc uh, a sculpture of him for Bologna, uh, which is now lost, uh, there's this story about how he, he, he asked Julius, so uh, do I depict you with a, are you gonna be holding the Bible or what? No, 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 you, 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 give, you give, us, give me a sword. 
So this is the kind, this is the kind of personality we're dealing with. And here, uh, he seems humble, frail, you know, not like squeezed into a corner, wearing his, not his regalia, but his, his everyday clothing. It's still quite fine, but it's, 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 it's the, it's the Kamaru and the um, Wotsata of, of, of the everyday wear for the Pope. And he's in a normal chair, not in his throne, and so on. Normal. Uh, it's, still, it's still nice. But, but anyway, so, and we're looking down on him slightly. This is really uh, uh, surprising for somebody like, of, of his reputation. Um, when Raphael was painted, he was sick. Uh, he had been on campaign in Bologna, uh, in Emilia Romagna. He'd fallen sick, uh, and again, he was fighting against the French. And, and he'd grown a beard and you see the beard here. Um, that was in contravention of church, uh, conve uh, church policy, like priests, clergy was not supposed to wear beards. That, that was for the Orthodox Church and for Jews and Muslims, all the ones who got it wrong. Uh, the Roman Church you don't, didn't have beards. But anyway, he grew a beard because he was bedridden, he was sick. And he, th he turned it into a, a sort of an issue of branding, um, whereby he said uh, he would not, and this is like, goes back to classical antiquity, he was aware of that, um, he would not cut his beard until the French were expelled from the Ital Italian peninsula, which he actually succeeded in doing very briefly. They came back, but anyway. Um, so, so he's wearing that beard here, uh, and he's despondent. And this is a time when the war is going badly. He's sick. Uh, there are several false starts where, or false endings uh, where people thought that he was going to die. He fell sick uh, like on several occasions during these years and ended up dying in 1513. Um, so Raphael depicts him as a compromise, as, as weak in some ways. Also strong-willed. I mean, it's not that it's not a sympathetic portrait, but there's a, there's a nuance here. We don't know what the purpose of it was. It, we can, I can't imagine the, 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 he would have wanted the public to see him like this. So one theory is that it was made for uh, the family mausoleum in Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome, um, and is really meant for the eyes of God and not for the eyes of the public. It became, uh, when he died in 1513, it was, it was exhibited next to the high altar in that church and was there for about 80 years. So everybody saw it, all artists copied it, and this is why it became so influential, so it became a very public picture. But I don't think that was the intention. Anyway, uh, what, Raff, what uh, Julius initially employed Raphael to do was be part of an artistic team uh, that were to decorate his new apartments in the Apostolic Palace. He had moved upstairs, he, he did not want to stay in the, the current apartments because his hated predecessor, Adrian VI, the, the Borgia Pope, had, had stayed there and he didn't like him. Um, and so he, he renovated the, uh, the upstairs and, and had, had them decorated. And this is Raphael's most famous work. It's, it's basically his decoration of the so-called Stanza della Segnatura, which was the Pope's private library. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is the first part Raphael started painting, and very quickly he became the head of, of, of this decorative uh, program uh, of all the rooms, and it would occupy him and his workshop for the rest of his career. Um, at this stage, he's still just painting this. Uh, it's divided into its four walls and a, and a, and a dome or not a dome, a vault, uh, and, and, and the theme is knowledge, is, is human knowledge. Uh, it's a library, it's divided into four sections, each a category of knowledge. Uh, there's theology, uh, and then there's philosophy, as we, we have here, and then there's law and poetry. And, and it's about how these, these four, these are the four great categories of, of, of human knowledge, and it's how they interact and how they're codependent. Everything is codependent in Raphael. Um, and, and this is sort of a visualization of that. And the most, most importantly, uh, most famously, that's the School of Athens, for which we have a drawing. I mean, in, in the exhibition, we, we, of course, can't represent a fresco in the original, uh, but we have a, a series of drawings for these, uh, for, for these decorations of these rooms. This beautiful drawing of, of Diogenes, uh, whom we have here, a metal point drawing done from the life. But, okay, so the School of Athens, it's very important. We have that as a reproduction in the exhibition. I thought it was, it was crucial to have it. It's his most famous image. It's the one that best sums up what he's about. The, what he's visualizing here is secular knowledge. It's philosophy and, by extension, natural science, or natural, uh, natural philosophy, natu which is what we call science. Um, and it is, it is depicted through the device of primarily the Greek philosophers of antiquity, there are also some non-Greeks here, but mostly Greek philosophers of antiquity, all situated in this great architectural space, which is based in part on his observations of Roman architecture, classical Roman architecture, but also the, uh, the, the, the plans that his, his older friend and mentor, Donato Bramante, 
had for the new St. Peter's, because that's another project that Julius had uh, started. His most ambitious architectural project was to, he t tore down the old St. Peter's, the old Christian church, the basilica um, in the Vatican, uh, to build a, a huge new structure, which is the one we know today. Uh, and Bramante was the architect of that at this point. Uh, it was not built yet, but this is based on some of those ideas. So we have, uh, at center, we have the two most important philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, they're the only ones who are uh, framed against the sky. Plato is uh, light-footed and point upwards, uh, whereas Aristotle is very firmly planted on the ground and gestures, gestures downwards. This indicates the, the general avenues of, research, of, of in, uh, inquiry that they, they represent. Uh, Plato is the idealist, he deals in abstract concepts. Uh, Aristotle is the empiricist who studies nature and human behavior. And, and on either side, fanning out from them are uh, the, the philosophers that in roughly represent those two basic lines of inquiry in Western thinking. And they're all exchanging knowledge. They're dis uh, discussing, debating, disagreeing, um, but they're all interdependent. They're all, uh, they, it's the building of and production of knowledge happening in community, between people, not alone. And this is very important. And, and, and each figure reacts to the other figures, is dependent on the other figures, is thought as part of, as a, as part of a whole. Down here we have Pythagoras, and there's a blackboard uh, one of the students holds up, which maps the mathematical uh, chart, uh, the, the, ma the mathematical uh, description of the harmony of music. And that again goes back to the idea of, of music as representing the order of the cosmos, uh, the divine order of the cosmos. Um, and that order is reproduced in us and the way we interact when, when we are at our best. And um, most beautifully, perhaps, so one of his great inventions is, is this group down here where we have uh, Euclid uh, in the guise of Bramante um, uh, d demonstrating uh, a, a geometrical principle here. So Pythagoras is, is, is uh, arithmetic, and here we have geometry. Um, so again, the, 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 the categories of knowledge and inquiry. So he's surrounded by four students who uh, all are reacting to what he's demonstrating. Uh, there's, a, there's one here who's not quite understanding yet, attempting, concentrating to understand it. There's one here who thinks he's understood it, maybe he's understood some of it and he's trying to explain. There's one here who's seeking guidance from one, one of his uh, co-students. And there's this one who has sort of a revelation, who's, who's understanding, suddenly has insight. And in a way, these four students become a sequential narrative of the process of learning. This is unprecedented. Like, nobody at this time would have thought, like, okay, depict learning. Like, if, if you do that, you just, like, you, you do some figures, that allegorical figures that represent learning or something like that. Raphael is describing it as a process, how the experience of learning is. This is his great genius, his synthetic mind. Uh, somebody is telling him that this is what he has to do, he has to do like the philosophers, whatever, he has to represent philosophy, and this is what he comes up with, and it's completely unprecedented. Um, and clearly he was also proud of it because he painted himself here with one of his friends. Uh, this is one of his great, great achievements. It's, it's, all, like, it, it's about the, the building of community, of the harmony between people, and ultimately the building of civilization, how we as a species survive and thrive together. Uh, he went on to, as I said, to decorate uh, several more rooms, uh, increasingly with the aid of his workshop. Here we have some beautiful drawings for the, the, the next room, the, the Stanza di Eliodoro. This is an exhibition, uh, and his painting style developed a lot in this, um, in, in, over the years here. We're in 1514, 1515 here. Uh, and it's just to show you what kind of drawings we have. This is for the vault of the Stanza di Eliodoro. Uh, we have a cartoon, which is the full-scale drawing that is used to transfer the design onto the wet plaster to be painted there. Uh, Raphael was a meticulous planner, uh, in part because he was working in fresco, and fresco dries quickly, so you can't improvise. You have to really know what you're doing. But also because, as this, and this is what you see in the, the School of Athens, because his compositions are so finely organized that if you start, you, you can't improvise that kind of thing. You have to plan it out so there's the harmony across. If you start removing figures from Raphael's exhibition, uh, for his compositions, they start falling apart. Um, so, so he w would plan very meticulously. This is Moses. This is Moses in the burning bush. So this is Moses before the, uh, before God ha uh, appearing in the burning bush. This is, of course, not a cartoon. This is an earlier study um, for the same composition, uh, and it's this composition. You see it here, uh, in, in, in the, in the ceiling. 
What he also did, uh, spinning off from this, and he started expanding his repertoire. Uh, so this drawing here is for the vault of, not of the Stanza di Eleodoro, but the Stanza della Signatura. It's above, uh, or to the side of the School of Athens, and it's the Judgment of Solomon. And here we have a soldier who would be holding a baby here uh, that he was about to cleave in half with one of the mothers from that story in the Bible. And then uh, he adapts that, he doesn't use that figure for, for, the, for that fresco, but he adapts it for uh, what becomes the Massacre of the Innocents. And this is a, a, a new, um, inspired by Albrecht Dürer, whom he was very aware of and who was a pioneer in printmaking in terms of printmaking as a artistic, a creative outlet, but also as a way of branding yourself. Raphael was quite aware that he was painting for the Pope and other elite clientele, and therefore most people wouldn't see his, uh, his inventions. So he, he turned to printmaking to, to expand knowledge and, and his brand and disseminate his inventions much more broadly, both in terms of original design, so this is a, the Massacre of the Innocents, it's made for print, it not, it's not, doesn't reproduce a painting he did. It's made for this particular print, and it's a real a demonstration of his skill at composing uh, complicated, dramatic um, uh, subjects, such as the Massacre of the Innocents, where we have muscular bodies in motion, which is one of the great things one could do as an artist at this point. And Michelangelo was the great master of it, and here he's appropriating ideas from Michelangelo to show what he can do. Uh, this was immensely influential, this print, and had wide circulation. Uh, he allied himself with a publisher and several printmakers, including Marcantonio Mar Raimondi, who did this, who was one of the great engravers of the time. Uh, and he also did prints after uh, designs that he did for painting and so on. So it was not just original. Original and reproductions of, or re sort of at least repetitions of things he, he'd done for painting. What he also did was he started working with sculptors. He, he was employed in, in a, v a variety of projects, uh, not just from the Pope, but also Agostino Chigi, who was uh, the Pope's banker and the richest man in Italy, who uh, employed him as an architect and as a designer for various things. This is for a chapel, um, one, one chapel at Santa Maria della Pace that, that um, uh, Chigi had uh, acquired. And this is just to show you how he designed for sculpt sculpture. He called in a, a sculpture a sculptor body of his from Perugia, uh, Cesarino Rossetti, probably, it's probably him. And, and so he collaborated with him in order to create these sculptural roundels, which was going to sit around a painting of the, of the resurrected Christ that he never did. Uh, and th there in the exhibition, you can see the drawings he did uh, preparing. And so the, the sculptor comes in and interprets Raphael's designs, and it's a collaboration. He's a great collaborator, and his, his workshop is, is growing at this point, incorporating publishers, printmakers, sculptors, architects, engineers, uh, all kinds of people. Uh, it becomes more than a workshop. It becomes an enterprise. It becomes a, he's an entrepreneur. He's somebody who completes major projects. Uh, here we have just this extraordinary drawing for a resurrection of Christ, probably not for that chapel, but uh, another resurrection. And, and it's just extraordinary to see, on the one hand, uh, here we have his sort of brainstorming drawing where he's, he's learning from Leonardo. Leonardo is the pioneer in sketching as a way of working out ideas, thinking through drawing. That's something that Leonardo really introduced into drawing, and which Raphael uh, like learned from him. And we have very few drawings by Raphael of this kind, probably because they've been thrown out. But we have this one, and it's just extraordinary. He's working out. It's the soldiers scattering around the tomb as Christ is rising out of it, and you see them how he's working out their postures here, and and it becomes this big mess where he's just he he's drawing. Bef he's thinking while drawing. It's the drawing prompts the thinking. Uh, and the reason this has survived is, of course, what's on the other side, which is a very closely observed study from the model in the studio of one of the soldiers who's going to be at the tomb, uh, beautifully done in black chalk. So this is the range of Raphael as a draftsman and his way of preparing uh, compositions. Incidentally, very Leonardesque in, in, in concept, very Michelangelo-esque. Um, again, he's looking to those artists. Uh, this is another chapel of Kiji's, uh, and here we have him as an architect. We have the, the floor plan of it here in the exhibition. You see it's, 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 uh, it's, it seems square, but it's octagonal. It has these integrations on, this, on, the, on the corners that you have here with these slightly convex cornicing here. Um, this is the burial, eventual burial chapel of Agostino Kiji, and it's no expense spared. The most expensive uh, different kinds of stone, marble and other stone, uh, is used, uh, gilding, uh, and it's, a, it's really a total work of art. Raphael des uh, designs the, the architecture of the chapel and everything that goes in it. The sculpture, the painting, the, um, 
both fresco and, and, and other painting, and, uh, and also eventually the, the, the dome, which I'll get to in a minute, which is mosaic. All of this is Raphael. These tombs, these pyramid pyramidal tombs, of course, uh, inspired eventually by Egyptian pyramids, but through uh, interpretations in ancient Rome, are, is where Agostino Chigi and his brother are buried. And they, they um, break with, the, with the, the cornicing here to give this sense of, of the spirit rising up. It's, that's the, it's the, the, the theme is the, and there was going to be uh, possibly a resurrection here, certainly an, at some, one point an assumption of the Virgin. Eventually, uh, Raphael died and they didn't finish it, so this was finished by Sebastiano del Piombo. Uh, these, are, are later, these are all later things. This is Bernini. It was only finished in the 17th century, so this is Bernini. But this sculpture is by Raphael, or designed by Raphael for somebody else to carve. Uh, and here we have the, the dome, as I said, um, the drum here with, with, uh, with representation of Genesis, and here we have God the Father receiving the spirits from the heavens, uh, surrounded by uh, representations of the zodiac. And here we have one of Raphael's designs for an angel that sits. Uh, it's one of these angels. I, now I suddenly can't spot it. But like that, that's Raphael's design for the mosaicist to, to convert to mosaic. So this is, this is what Raphael is thinking now. He, he's thinking much broader than painting. He's a designer and an entrepreneur. And he, wor he works at these total uh, works of art. As an architect, uh, he, he built a variety of projects, many of which are lost or weren't finished. Uh, most importantly, Already in 1514, he's assigned to, comp to work on St. Peter's because Bramante died uh, that year, and Pope Leo X, uh, Julius II's successor, who loved Raphael and, and uh, employed him for everything, uh, of course assigned him to, do, uh, to build St. Peter's. And so he works on St. Peter's at this, in this period. He doesn't get that very far. It's mostly about the foundations and the, the central plan of it, which is based on Bramante's ideas. Uh, but he never, never gets very far because he dies before it happens. But um, this is m his biggest project that was actually somewhat completed. It was uh, a, a villa outside of Rome, north of Rome in the, in the, the hills, uh, for the Pope's uh, cousin, Giulio de' Medici, who would later be Clement VII. Um, and it was, it was projected as an enormous complex, like a sprawling complex, based on the villas of antiquity, the Roman villas of antiquity. Uh, and uh, only part of it was built. It was supposed to have a theater, uh, like baths, uh, all kinds, stables, all kinds of things. Um, huge. Uh, this is what was built. And, uh, and especially this part here, this larger here with the windows here, these have since been broken through. Uh, and you see that's this. Um, and that was built, a lot of it was completed after Raphael's death uh, by his, by his uh, workshop. Um, it's, it's, it integrates these niches with these, these pilasters and again has this lightness. Um, the lightness, of the, the flow from the pilasters into the, the vault, uh, and this light cornicing and these niches that sort of penetrate the wall, and then these great windows, uh, which probably which it was just going to be a larger, it wasn't going to have windows, so a lot of, it's a very light-filled room. Um, and then these, these beautifully decorated uh, ceilings done by Giulio Romano, his, one of his greatest uh, assistants, and uh, Giovanni de Udine, another, um, who, was, who specialized in this kind of decoration based on antique forms and the observation of antique decorations, so like antique Roman decoration. So, so this is part of his architectural uh, endeavor. At the same time, he is, as I said, uh, they were studying um, classical decorations, uh, developing this whole la language of grotesques, as they're called, the ones in the ceiling, like these, these uh, vegetal and animalistic forms that you use for decoration. And uh, so he was observing classical uh, architecture and classical artifacts in general very closely. And one of the reasons he was doing that is because Leo X also thought, uh, not just architect of St. Peter's and all the paintings, uh, but also, of course, he has to be chief archaeologist of Rome. He was appointed surveyor of ancient Rome in 1513. As soon as uh, Leo X could, was pope, it's like, yeah, you, you do that. Um, and it was a difficult position because I mean, he was somebody who was passionate about classical antiquity, as, as many great artists were. I mean, that that's, was the source of their learning in many ways. Um, but he also was in charge of appropriating stones from the, from the, old, from the classical buildings to build new things, such as St. Peter's. So he was supposed to both preserve and destroy uh, at the same time. And he formulated these conflicted thoughts in a letter that we have in the exhibition, which is in, in draft drafted by his friend Baldassare Castiglione, a humanist, uh, diplomat, um, with whom he had an intellectual exchange uh, through, throughout these years. And, um, 
And it's, an, it's a fascinating letter. I don't want to get into it too much here. We have it in partial translation upstairs. Uh, but it does describe this conflict. And also some of the, the just the practicals of, of measuring buildings, of, of, of surveying. Uh, and and it, it talks about art theory. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating on a number of levels. Uh, here we have a beautiful red chalk drawing of one of the horses on the, uh, the Criminal Hill uh, with measurements drawn in. Um, so he's very closely studying this. And one of his, uh, this is also, this is, a, this is one of the few, it's quite rare to have drawings at this time that are made on the spot. Uh, and this is made on the spot in, and it's the only one by Raphael we have, made on the spot in the, the Roman Forum uh, at the time, showing the ruins as they appeared with, with contemporary people walking around. It has an incredible immediacy. Um, it's unfortunately quite faded because it's a metal point drawing, but uh, you, get a, you get the sense. And it was then turned into a print uh, with a story from, from the Aeneid. Um, you can see that this part of it here is from this. But it, it, I don't think that was the intention. This is, this is a, a, him recording his thoughts right there uh, as he's out surveying. Um, one of the big plans there were was to, to reconstruct ancient Rome, to create a map of what it would have looked like. And he, he was working with a variety of people, including Baldassare Perucci, another architect. Uh, and here's a partial reconstruction of the Roman Forum uh, based on Perucci's drawings that Raphael was involved with. It was very uh, ahead of its time in terms of archaeology. Nobody else was doing anything like this. And um, it, it never, again, it was, it was a project that never went anywhere because he died. Uh, you see a theme here. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, th as I said, this was a time when his workshop was expanding, uh, also in terms of painting. We have several uh, paintings from this period in the exhibition. Uh, I mentioned Giulio Romano before. He was only one of, of a group of painters, a large group of painters that worked with Raphael, some closely, some more peripherally, uh, some as contractors, some as, 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 as like, uh, permanent assistants. Um, and these paintings, you see, compared to the paintings we saw earlier, they're very different. Um, the volume of the figure, they're, they're more monumental, they're, they're more three-dimensional, uh, and the, the, the colors are more saturated than, for example, the School of Athens, um, and more, there's more dramatic effects of light and shade. Uh, he's developing his pictorial language. And uh, it, at this point, he's, Leonardo has also arrived in Rome. Uh, he's not really painting, but he's there. Uh, and, and I think they rekindled their friendship, and he's, he's again talking to Leonardo about the representation of light and shade and, and, and defining the figure through that and so on. Uh, so that's part of what's happening. Uh, he's also looking at Sebastiano del Piombo, who's a great Venetian painter, who is a rival of his, allied with Michelangelo. Uh, he's learning from him. He's learning from everybody, and he's doing his own thing. And I, the, the interest with, of these paintings, in a way, is that you could argue that, the, I, th I think uh, an argument could be made, and I think many people would recognize this, uh, of course, mileage might vary, that they're less affecting like, than, than those Madonnas we looked at earlier, that they're a little bit more distant. Um, and I think that, in part, is, a, uh, is accounted for by the fact that he hasn't painted everything himself. This is a, these are collaborations. Um, and if you go to the exhibition and look, I, I think one detail that is very revelatory is you look at the head of, the, of Christ here and the red of, head of um, John the Baptist here, you'll see that they're painted differently. This is more sensitive. This is, has more of a tactile surface to the hair. That, uh, this is more metallic. And I think there you have the separation of, of, um, uh, of responsibilities in the paintings. This is Raphael. This is Giulio Romano. The design is by Raphael. But, but th these are collaborations, these paintings. They're, they're still overseen by Raphael. They're supremely his designs. But he, he's drawing upon his, the very skilled people he has around him and who can really imitate his style. And I think it's the case with both of these paintings. Uh, this, on the other hand, another fantastic loan to the exhibition, I think is entirely Raphael. I mean, if you look at the surface of this painting, the richness of it, the variety of touch, the way he describes the different kinds of clothing, uh, the beautiful rendition of these instruments down here, and the, the organ, I think this is entirely Raphael. Um, but again, there are, Vasari says that Giovanni de Udine, who specialized in still life and animal painting and so on, did the, did the instruments. I don't think that's right. You can make up your own mind to see whether that's by, painted by somebody else. In, in any case, it's really beautifully painted. Uh, the, the theme here, this is a, a, an altar piece, and this is what he was doing too. He wasn't just painting for people in Rome. He was also uh, painting for patrons abroad. And this is for a very interesting patron, a female patron in Bologna, uh, who associated herself with St. Cecilia, the patroness of music. And so she is the main uh, focus of the picture, and she's surrounded by other saints. And this is very, this is quite conservative in a way, as a, as a brief and also as a general composition. 
a central saint surrounded by some other saints, and this is what the patron wants. Uh, we have uh, St. Paul, uh, John the Evangelist, uh, St. Augustine, and Mary Magdalene. What is happening here is St. Cecilia is, uh, we see her in a moment of ecstasy again, of, of um, religious ecstasy, uh, just like St. Catherine earlier. And this is why we've placed them across from each other in the, in part why we've placed them across from each other in the, in the axis of the exhibition. I think they're, they're paintings that speak to each other. She is looking upwards in this moment of ecstasy, listening to the heavenly choir here. She's forgetting about her, uh, her organ, which is falling apart. The pipes are falling onto the ground with these other discarded instruments down here. It's the contrast between secular, well, timely music, the music that we create, the imperfections of the world, and the perfection of God's harmony. That's, that's the basic theme of it. How Raphael makes this relatable, I think, in part, is that he depicts it, to me, uh, as, as almost as if we are entering a chamber music recital or a concert by a jazz trio or something. We're coming in, and we see people listening to music, each in their way, deeply absorbed, slightly restless, seeking the gaze of somebody else, and she's disturbed because we're coming in. She sees us coming in. So it's like entering a, a, a concert, a small concert. And I think Raphael is very good at, at, at making these relatable moments, embedding these relatable moments in, in otherwise very contrived uh, compositions, and again, making the contrived seem natural. Uh, I'll, I'll just say one thing more about his workshop, uh, because this is the one real um, uh, sort of novelty in the exhibition, is this drawing, which came up uh, for auction in 2019 in France. Nobody had ever like, seen it before. It was unpublished, or completely unknown. Everybody, like several people independently of each other recognized this as Raphael. It was acquired for an American private collection for quite a lot more than, than what they'd expected to get for it. It was just given to uh, Giovanni Francesco Penny, which was one of Raphael's assistants. Uh, and it is now in the exhibition, it's the Holy Family, with this very ex this extraordinary de depiction of the, of, of the Christ child with long hair and hollow chested. Very strange. Probably based on a real child. It was eventually used by Giulio Romano for this painting, as you can see. Um, in the Getty, which is painted after Raphael's death, based on the drawing. And this is what happened after his death. A lot of his drawings were used by his assistants to create uh, works of art. Uh, and this is one of them, and you can see how he beefs up. Uh, he doesn't have the hollow chest anymore. They, they, that's not Giulio Romano. He does these puffed, puffed up children, uh, muscular. Um, but but it's, it's, an, it's, it's just to show you how the workshop, a little bit, like we hint at the workshop in the exhibition. We don't want to get into it too much because it's such a big issue, and we just didn't want to, uh, we want to look, look at Raphael himself rather than all the people around him in a way. Uh, so so we, we sort of play it down a little bit, but it is there. Um, the biggest pictorial project Raphael undertook for Leo X was a series of 10 tapestries to be hung at the lower register of the Sistine Chapel um, for special occasions. The tapestries the, in their iconography are based on the lives of St. Peter and St. Paul. So th it's from, taken from the Acts of the Apostles. Raphael knew uh, that these tapestries were to compete with the most sensational work of art uh, of contemporary art at the time, which everybody admired, which was the ceiling, of course, by Michelangelo. Uh, Last Judgment had not been painted yet. Um, he was also complementing the paintings here in the middle, which were from the 1480s, and are by his former colleague and mentor, Pietro Perugino, as well as Botticelli and Gail and Dio, and other great uh, artists of the previous generation. So he's complementing those things, both in terms of iconography and in terms of artistic skill, but he's mostly aware that he has to compete with that. Uh, and so he pours in all his energies into these tapestries, in, in terms of storytelling, characterization, his knowledge of antiquity and architecture, and so on. All of it, he really devotes a lot of his time to these, to these uh, great compositions. And he, he draws, or paints, uh, these large paintings on paper to use as guides for the weavers. Tapestries could not be woven in Rome, nor could they be woven in anywhere in Italy if they had to be good. They had to be uh, woven in the Netherlands, Brussels. Uh, the workshop of Peter van Els, the best weaver in Europe. So Raphael was very concerned. I mean, he couldn't travel to, to Brussels. He didn't have time for that. Uh, so he was very concerned that, that they get it right. So he did these paintings on paper, these huge paintings on paper that are preserved, seven of them, not all ten, but seven of them preserved uh, in the V&A. Um, and he sent those to, uh, sent those to Brussels uh, for the weavers to use as gui guidelines. What the weavers would then do when these arrived they would, uh, or maybe actually I think it was probably done in Raphael's workshop, um, they would put little uh, pinholes throughout, uh, th around the contours of all the figures, all the forms, 
and then transfer that design onto a new uh, set of uh, pieces of paper. So to create a copy cartoon uh, with just the outlines. That cartoon then, and this is the same they do with the frescoes, it's an ancillary cartoon. That cartoon then would go under the loom that the weavers would, 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 would when, when they were weaving, they were looking at the cartoon would be under the loom and would be rolled up as they were completing the tapestry and thus destroyed, basically, in the process. It was woven from behind, which is why the, 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 the direction is the opposite uh, in, in, the, in the tapestry. Then the, uh, the original painted cartoon by Raphael and his, possibly his workshop to an extent, uh, would be hung on the wall. Um, it was probably going to be in strips. It was probably not all in one, but like it was hung on the wall as a, as a guideline so they could get the colors right. And Raphael really challenged the weavers by having a lot of effects of light and shade, which is very difficult to achieve in, in, in tapestry. Uh, they did their best. I mean, these are the best weavers in Europe, and they, 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 they achieved a lot of it. Of course, this is very faded compared to how colorful it would have been at the time, like immensely colorful. And you get a sense of what the colors would have been like from looking at the, the cartoon. Um, what, also, what also had to go into these uh, tapestries was an enormous amount of gold thread. Uh, because they had to be the best, the, the finest, like the most opulent, uh, because Leo X was like that. Uh, he, it was an enormous expense to produce these. Uh, and you, you see that in the, when you look at the tapestry in the, in the exhibition. We have, this, we have this tapestry, which is fantastic. That's come from the Vatican. It's one of the originals. Uh, it's, it's just extraordinary that we have it here. And the, the <coughs> you can see all the gold thread um, catching the light in, in the room out there. Um, the, we, in the exhibition, we have hung it next to... Uh, not one of the cartoons because they can't be moved. They're behind very heavy glass uh, over at the V&A and are very fragile, so obviously can't be moved. But we were so lucky that um, coming up to the Raphael year, they were, they were renovating the room over at the V&A and they were taking the glass off the, the, the cartoons that are installed there in the great Raphael room. Um, and a company called Facta Marte, uh, we're based in Madrid, uh, who specialize in digital recreations and, and physical, like not, not digital and uh, traditional crafts as well, recreations of artworks, uh, came and recorded like very high, high quality recording, three-dimensional recordings of the surfaces of these, uh, these paintings. This is the room as it looks now after the, the new lighting, the new uh, wall colors, new interpretation. Sadly, not new glass because they, they couldn't, uh, and the glass is green. It's, it's a really, it's a frustrating, uh, very frustrating. I mean, the, the glass is going greener by, by the year, and it's obscuring the colors of the... So hopefully, eventually, there'll be new glass on them. Um, but they recorded them, and here you see, uh, and then they, 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 they recreated them in th uh, three-dimensional printing. So you, they're, they're printed th with the actual surface, the texture, the, all the creases and all the imperfections of, of the, the object are there in the recreation. Um, and that's what we put, put on the wall. And it gives you a sense of that you can't really get at the V&A because they're up high, they're behind this green glass. You get a sense of, of, of their freshness. Uh, so it's just that's an aside. It's like something I'm, I'm quite invested in doing for exhibitions. And, and, and I think very, the, the possibilities of, of, of using this kind of technology uh, to, to help uh, us learn and appreciate art, learn about and appreciate art. We end the exhibition with a, a room of portraits, of the portraits of the last five, six, seven years of his career. Uh, he was so busy that he did not really have much time to paint portraits. Uh, he would eventually sometimes do it if there was a political imperative or a lot of money involved. He would do it or he would assign it to Giulio Romano or something. Uh, so when he really did portraits was when he was goofing off, when he was uh, not working on one of the big projects that he was supposed to complete. Uh, he would just paint his friends. And these are some of his most intimate and most lushly painted uh, works of, of, of his whole career. I mean, these, these last ones. He put in all his energies because these are things he was in really personally invested in. Um, not that he wasn't personally invested in so many other things, but really uh, these, these paintings. And here we have him painting himself uh, in the, maybe the last year of his life, uh, looking out at us, characteristically not alone, but with a friend, uh, probably Giulio Romano. Giulio Romano was a very, very talented artist. I think by this time he was already hoping to break out and do his own thing. Uh, and he would eventually go on to, right, quite soon after, uh, because of Raphael's death, uh, he would go on to become a great painter and architect in his own right. And you have that sense of him here. He's looking back to his master, who's holding paternalistically a little bit, uh, guiding him with his hand on his shoulder, and he's pointing outwards towards us. He's moving out into the world. Um, 
and there's a generosity of, of interaction here. Raphael is, is guiding him into the world. You could also argue, this is what Tom Henry uh, says, um, my colleague who, and co-curator, that Raphael's right arm seems to be sort of merged with Julio's right arm, al almost as if Julio, it represents how Julio, uh, Raphael acts through his assistants, like they execute his designs. You could also see it like that. Um, also importantly, they are, they are depicted as gentlemen in black clothing with white shirts, with a sword. That's the, all the accoutrements of a gentleman, not an artisan. And I, as you remember, I said Raphael was born to an artisan's family. In the period of his lifetime, the conception of artists was changing. It was changing from the idea that they were craftspeople to individual artists as we understand it, like geniuses uh, who would create things by, out of their own personalities. Uh, that, they were, that painting was becoming a fine art. Same with sculpture. This was happening, and Raphael is a key figure in that, and this is what he's representing here. By this point, Raphael was, had become quite rich. He'd acquired a, pal a palace in the, like, close to the Vatican that he'd made his home. Uh, he was engaged to the niece of one of the most powerful ca cardinals uh, in, the, in the Vatican, uh, not something he was particularly interested in. I mean, the only, we have two letters from him, um, and, all, and they're quite dis in some ways quite disappointing. We only have two, two letters, so we don't have much documentation about what he was thinking or whatever. But they're about money, work opportunities, and social status. He was very focused on these things. And he mentions this, this uh, engagement, and it's like he's really not keen on it, but it would help him uh, socially. Um, and, and there were rumors at this point that he was being uh, prepared for, to become a, be, become a cardinal, which would have been completely unprecedented for something of his status. So his, his, the social mobility of Raphael is extraordinary, and it says something about his ambition too. I mean, he was very, very ambitious, um, and, and very skilled at social relations, and, and, and just the fact that he had so many projects is testament to that. Like, everybody wanted to work with him, or having to work for them. Um, and, and so this is, this is very much part of Raphael too. I mean, there is this ruthless side to him, this, this uh, socially mobile, ambitious side. It's not just the, the gentle, wonderful person that Clearly, he also was to many people, uh, with good friends and so on. Important to remember. He, what he could not have foreseen when he painted this uh, uh, painting was that he, within about a year, he would be dead. Uh, just before Easter in 1520, he came down with a fever, unexpectedly. He was bedridden for about 10 days, and then he died. On Good Friday, 6 April 1520. This was a universal shock. Uh, the Pope is reported to have been following his illness and, and, was, and he sunk into his grief when he learned about uh, Raphael's death. Uh, and it provoked a flurry of epitha epitaphs from, from the who's who of the, the greatest, the great and the good of Roman society, all the humanists and his friends and so on, who described like, what is the loss of this wondrous person who almost was cast. I mean, the fact that he died on Good Friday also, he was sort of likened to Christ. Uh, he had, was this Christ-like figure who promised to resurrect uh, the once great Rome, and now it was, he was lost, and, and so on. And there was even descriptions of how the foundations of the Vatican cracked when he died, just like uh, the rending of the veil and the earthquake uh, when Christ breathed his last on the cross. So there are these messianic overtones in the descriptions of Raphael. He was so famous and so like universally loved and sort of regarded as this, this fantastic figure. Um, and he, so he immediately passed into myth uh, upon his death. And there's a picture, yeah, so uh, I, I'm running out of time here, but like, um, if you will indulge me. Uh, this is his last great uh, painting. It's not in the exhibition. It's one of the <laughs> paintings of the exhibition. Um, <laughs> could not, it's in the Vatican. This was, he was working on this and as he died, his beer was placed in front of it. His dead body was placed in front of it. Um, and it, it, it is one of his last great achievements, um, this, describing the transfiguration of Christ uh, when he's, his divinity is confirmed on Mount Tabor. And then the, this, the, the story of, the, of a boy possessed by devils down here. That the, the apostles are powerless to, um, to help, but they point to Christ because he can help them. He's the only one who can save us. That's the, that's the theological idea of it. But it's, it's just an, it's an incredible uh, composition which really works with these, these uh, contrasts of, of, of light and shade, uh, the, the placement of figures uh, in, in space, as I said, the ma manipulation of space where the mountain seems distant and at the same time is right next to them. It's a very low mountain in a way, and Christ, who's supposed to be far away, is almost as big as they are. I mean, the way that he can manipulate space, he thinks always of the picture first. 
not as like rule, rules of perspective or anything like that. And we have one beautiful drawing in the show uh, from the, for, like, again, an ancillary cartoon with the pounce marks you see here uh, that is used for this figure here. Fantastic drawing uh, from this very late, late phase. This, and that is in contrast, of course, to these, these portraits we have. This is a, this is a painting that um, may not be by Raphael, <laughs> another one. Uh, but it's very famous, and it's incredibly important for understanding uh, the myth of Raphael. The cause of his death is unknown. He had this fever. There are contemporary descriptions, and especially Vasari, who's writing a generation later, says that it had to do with his, uh, his uh, promiscuousness, that he was burning his candle at both ends, and that there's stories about his mistresses, and so on. And, and, so, and, and this, this painting has been seen as part of that. Vasari says that a painting like this, uh, of, a, of a naked woman uh, sitting, a portrait, in his house. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a generation later. And this may be uh, the, his, one of his lovers. Uh, she, she has um, an armband with his name on it here, uh, as, as if she belongs to Rafa. Uh, and she's, she's painting in the evening. There's, this, like, there's, there's, there's some intimacy of being painted at night, which is also very unusual, uh, against a, a bush of laurels, which have um, association of procreation of marriage, but especially of making babies. Um, so there's, there's a lot of these erotic undertones here. Whether this is actually by Raphael, I mean, it's, I, I think you should try to make up your own mind, see it with the other pictures uh, in, in, the, uh, in that room. Um, it is harder uh, in its finish. It has a sort of a more enameled surface to it, especially in the head. Not so much here. This is very beautifully and sensitively painted, but this is quite hard. Um, and it's painted on, on panel. The other paint, some of the other paintings up there are painted by uh, painting on, on canvas, which makes a difference. We're going to get to that in a moment. Uh, but it may not be by Raphael. It may be by Giulio Romano, who was, as I said, a greatly skilled painter who could imitate Raphael. Uh, and it may, be, it may be a painting of a courtesan. There were these high-level courtesans in, in Rome at the time uh, who were very admired and intellectually uh, sophisticated and had a, like, a clientele amongst the great and the good and so on. It could be something like that. It's a very unusual painting and it has given rise to all kinds of speculation about Raphael's love life, sort of gossipy tradition. It's called La Fornarina, the baker's daughter, because there was this 18th century legend that his lover was a commoner, a baker's daughter. It's, it's completely fabricated, but it's, it's a good story and, and it's part of, it's part of the, Ra like a Raphael's, the myth of Raphael, which is so important. Um, and that he was preparing for his own myth is also um, uh, indicated by the fact that he was buried in the Pantheon uh, and that he had bought a plot in the Pantheon for his tomb six, seven years before. He didn't know he was going to die. He invested many, a lot of money in buying a burial uh, plot in the Pantheon and maintaining it for years. So he was planning for his posthumous reputation. The Pantheon was not a site of burial at this time. It was a Christian church. It was rumored, the story went that like, when it was consecrated as a church in the fourth century, bones of Christian martyrs were transferred there. Uh, and this is what Raphael is thinking, I'm going to be buried there. And indeed he was, uh, and he was also drawing it. There's this fantastic drawing um, where he's drawing it freehand, much earlier, much earlier, like upon his arrival in Rome. Um, so he's planning for his posthumous reputation, and he creates by being buried there, by virtue of being buried there, as the first modern person. Uh, he creates the idea of a pantheon of great people, great men, of course, as it, as it was at this time. Uh, and, and, you, and that was emulated all over the world in the following centuries, including most significantly probably in the Pantheon, the Pantheon in Paris, with all the great, uh, the great uh, French um, <coughs> figures of history buried there. And, and indeed, the Pantheon became that. Uh, and that's through Ra Raphael's agency and, again, this ambition. He was somebody who, uh, who became an example to, to, to artists everywhere. He became the baseline for teaching art in the artistic academies across, that were, that were being, that were, that were starting in the, towards mid-century. It wasn't really, art academies were not really established yet. But he became the baseline, this is the model, Raphael is the one you have to emulate uh, as an artist. Uh, he's somehow neutral. He was the ideal everybody had to stroke, to, um, to, to strive towards uh, as artists. And it's only in the late 19th century and into the 20th century, modernism, pre-Raphaelite modernism, that there was a rebellion against this. Ruskin and people railed against this, this, this ossifying ideal of classical antiquity and so on, and the Renaissance and, and so on and so forth. But Raphael really is integral to our visual tradition. He, he's sort of the, the quintessential artist. Um, 
for better or worse, uh, or, and, and, and of course there's been a lot of resistance to it, but he is there somehow at the center. And I think the reason is not so much that he was so perfect and whatever, blah, 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 all those things, fine. And uh, he was also easy to imitate on a surface level. It's easy to imitate uh, his, his art. Uh, you can sort of paint in his style. Much harder to do with Michelangelo, for example, or Leonardo. Um, but the reason, I think, and, and this has to do with School of Athens, it has to do with a portrait like this one, painted on canvas. So he was discovering, at the end of his life, he was discovering the, the tactile, sensuous texture of canvas, uh, probably looking at works by Titian and other Venetian artists. And he was painting these portraits. This is Baldassare Castiglione, with whom he, um, with whom he composed that letter and had intellectual exchange over several years. And you feel that you feel the, the intimacy of their relation here. Uh, the, the in this mon almost monochrome portrait, toned down, very soft uh, fur in his in his jacket, um, giving a sense of int intimacy and softness. And then those piercing blue eyes that look at us, with intelligence, um, and. Of course, there's all, all the perfection, there's all the, 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 um, the description of our ideals as in the School of Athens. I think the fact that he paints us the way we want to see ourselves as people who work in harmony to create something greater together, I think that is very central to understanding why he is central to our visual tradition. He paints the paint, he holds up a mirror to us, showing us the better angels of our nature to uh, uh, appropriate Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it also is seen in portraits like this, it is the human connection that he forges. When he paints himself with a friend, he paints his legacy in a way. He paints his immediate legacy in that his, his uh, assistant would go off and, and become uh, to his own career, uh, artists would learn from him, but his legacy is also that human connection that we feel when we encounter these portraits at the end of the exhibition. And that we contemplate in a more abstract, but uh, an aspirational, but also in a way, affirming terms when we look at something like the School of Athens. So that's what I have to, have to say about Raphael. Uh, thank you for your indulgence, um, and hopefully enjoy the show. Thank you.